For years, China's leaders focused on internal factors contributing to smog, but with this new research, it's even clearer that there are external factors involved. Now, with U.S. President Donald Trump moving away from climate change science, some wonder if China could do the same. Jennifer Turner is director of the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. She doesn't think China will change its approach. I asked her why. Because, I mean, even, you know, even with this news that, well, the weather is making the pollution, it's not clearing out as fast, China is really committed in lowering their CO2 emissions because of the pollution problem. And while Beijing is still kind of languishing in smog, you know, you are seeing some progress. I mean, the fact that the coal coal production consumption is starting to go down. You know, it, it's also that it's, it's you know, they're, they're increasing even more their investment in clean energy. You know, clean energy, it's not only good for China. The Chinese are seeing this. This is part of a global market, right? They already control the, the um, solar panel sales around the world. But, you know, they're seeing, you know, the wind turbines, energy efficiency, you know, other, you know, this, for them, it's also part of a global market. So when you look at these studies about uh, climate change, which regions of China uh, are going to take it on the chin, so to speak? <laughs> the big question is, which region is not going to take it on the chin? I mean, everywhere. The risk is, is, is going to be extreme in China, no matter where you look. Because you have to think China's, their standard operating procedures for development, right? As fast as you can, as furious as you can, you know, use lots of water. They're trying to farm on very little land. And so, you know, they're kind of living on the razor's edge already. So climate change comes in, and that, that, that's kind of the tipping point. So northern China, it's already quite dry. It's going to get even drier. So that puts even greater pressure on, you know, the agriculture that's in the north, coal developments in the north. And even though they're decreasing it, you still need water. The cities that are gigantic, Beijing, 21 million, you still need that. Southern China, which is generally seen as more water-rich, and it's, it's going to get even more water in the next 10 years as the glaciers continue to melt. But once they're melted, the, the, the levels of the Yangtze, the Mekong River are going to go down. Now, the problem with that is not only is you less water, they're still continuing the build-out of hydropower, right? And so you're going to build more and more of these dams where there's less and less water. And so even if you look like at the Yangtze River flowing all the way down to Shanghai, I mean, we think of this as like a monster river. And, and the idea that it could maybe not all make it all the way to Shanghai, it seems unthinkable, could be thinkable. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's take that and, and expand it out further. So here I am, and I'm in a leadership position, and I say, okay, I'm going to target coal, and I'm going to target steel, and, and as you said, I'm going to gin up green energy, and you would think this going up, this going down, but now add uh, climate change. How does that limit the benefits of the steps that you're taking if you're in government? Well, I think that, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you have to kind of have the long picture in mind that, that, I mean, well, not only, you know, you need to mitigate climate change. I mean, China in 2013, they passed their first kind of climate adaptation plan. Still very much a work in progress. I mean, you know, they, they did get all the major ministries to come together saying we need to kind of figure out kind of, you know, what can we do? And I mean, the first step has been kind of an early warning system. A big piece of that is going to be um, sea level rise. I mean, think, you know, China, big cities all along the coast. Shanghai, predictions are, are that in 80 years, 76% of it could be underwater. Maybe a problem. I mean, and again, even before it, it's submerged, that you have times where, think of the Yangtze, right? Yangtze River comes down, flow lessens, the salt water intrusion gets higher. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not good. So it's something that you can't move quickly enough on when it comes no, to climate. you can't. And I think, and I think, but, you know, in the United States, I mean, we have lot, out in California and our coasts here, you know, a lot of cities and states are, are starting to, you know, come up with better plans on how they can deal with it. I think this is also a huge opportunity that the U.S. and China should continue to work on, not only the mitigation, but the adaptation, because our two countries are, are equally vulnerable to sea level rise. Jennifer Turner, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me in.